Thanks for the introductions. Uh, my name is Ayn. I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Cambridge. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, what we have seen from um, um, about the role of low-level cybercrime actors in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, this is joint work with Daniel Bent, Alice Richard, and Ross Anderson from University of Cambridge. Um, so um, the Russia-Ukraine conflict started in 2022. And uh, you may have heard lots of things on news about um, the actual battlefield. Um, uh, and uh, on the cyberspace, um, there's also lots of stories about uh, the impact of the war on uh, hackings and on cyber attacks. Um, one of the very popular uh, narrative around the world is uh, a massive cyber war um, with um, people believing that uh, it will be the first full-scale cyber war and uh, there will be a 30 folds of DDoS attack um, with lots of, and lots of, of youngster getting involved in attacking either uh, Russia and, and, and uh, Ukraine. Um, another contrary story about the cyber war is that uh, some researchers have uh, argued that the cyber war has been too slow, too weak, or uh, too insignificant, too volatile, and um, some um, argue that it may have been overhyped. Um, we have seen a lot of high-profile cyber attacks on uh, news and media. Uh, for example, Russia down satellite internet in Ukraine, um, or Russian hackers took it. Um, Ukrainians, Europeans um, with um, phishing attacks or data wipers. Uh, but one of the common things of these cyber attacks is, is that they appear to be state actors um, attacks. Um, one of the um, missing pieces that has not been documented in um, the literature is the role of low level cyber crime actors. Um, so these actors are actually um, the ones who, um, who are not really skilled, uh, but they can use uh, there's an echo here. Can you turn off the mic, please? Yeah. Um, they may not be really technically skilled, but uh, they can use um, existing tools and services to launch attack. Um, they are quite large in number, um, especially when cybercrime is now evolving, um, like uh, a cybercrime as a service model, when you can just go online and spend a few dollars, five or ten dollars, to buy some online subscriptions, and you put um, your victims who you want to attack on the website, and someone will do, will do it for you. Um, so these actors are large in number, and uh, uh, they contribute a very um, um, a very important uh, role in the cybercrime ecosystem. Um, so our, our approach is data driven. Uh, we collect um, some data set of cyber attacks, including website defacement attack. Uh, if you are not familiar with website defacement, uh, this is a um, one type of low level cyber attack that um, someone gain unauthorized access to your website or your servers, then they just change your, your website's appearance. Um, so we collect um, a few hundred thousands of website defacement attacks on uh, the defacement archive. So when uh, the hackers um, deface your website, they, they, they tend to put their achievement on, um, on uh, some defacement archive in order to promote uh, their achievement and to gain some fame and reputation. Um, we also collect uh, uh, 1.7 million of EDP amplification DDoS attack. Um, so by um, basically, we set up a network of honeypot around the world, emulating EDP pro pro uh, protocol. Uh, so when a hacker scanned the internet and found an um, EDP opening port, and we record the traffic going to our sensors, and uh, we uh, do not direct the uh, traffic to, to, to the victims. So by the way, so we are able to collect the uh, victim information, so we know who are being attacked. Um, we also collect the data set of the IT Army, Army of Ukraine Telegram channels. Um, so when the war happened uh, in 2022, there was a, um, a Telegram channels organized by the, the Ukrainian uh, government uh, to coordinate cyber attacks. So they try to attract uh, volunteer hacktivists to, to hacktivists to join the channels, and they posted some uh, uh, targets that they want to attack, and they hope that the volunteer hacktivists will attack these on behalf of them, of, of the group owners. Uh, we also collect a um, um, related post on the most 
the largest hacking forum, hack forums, uh, with over 100 discussion threads and uh, a few hundred act by a few hundred active users. So our first impressions is there is a big surge of website Facebook attack on Russia just on the invasion day. So. Um, the left hand side is a graph of the number of um, of the proportions of uh, website defacement attack just before the war. You can see that Russia accounted for just 0.6 percent, which is quite trivial. Uh, but on the war day, uh, the proportion increased to like 15 percent, which is much, much higher than before. And we found that uh, the attention was drawn to Russia rapidly just after uh, the invasions. Um, uh, just after a few hours, and uh, Russia appeared to be uh, intentionally targeted. Um, but our, our, our main question here is how long the effect lasts for. Um, here is the uh, number of um, defensive attacks targeting Russia and Ukraine. Um, we see here the, there's a peak of Russia um, defacement uh, on the invasion day. Uh, there's a very big spike, um, but the number of attackers did not in increase on the same day, but a few days later. Uh, the same spike, we see the same spike of uh, attacks targeting Ukraine um, happening two days later. And uh, similarly, the number of defaces picked one day later. Um, the second graph is the number of DDoS attack collected by, by our uh, sensors. Uh, you can see the same patterns here. We see lots of DDoS attack and um, Lots of DDoS attacks targeting Russia and Ukraine, um, with a very big wave of um, attacks um, against Russia just um, um, after one week or so. Um, and the similar thing we see from both website defacement and DDoS attack is that um, uh, attackers tend to um, to target Russia first, and the big wave of um, attacking Ukraine followed a few days later. Um, and one of the important findings here is both type of attacks appear rapidly, but they were rather short-lived. Short it lasted for just a couple of weeks then, so we do, we do not see uh, that amount of, of uh, attack um, yeah, after a couple of weeks. Um, so um, we look at uh, website defacement. Uh, um, so when we collect the data of website defacement, we collect the message that uh, attacker left behind after they, um, they deface um, a website. And we see that um, the website defacers are highly centralized. And uh, we see both new faces and old faces. Uh, that means there are some, um, some, uh, some uh, defaces that did not attack Russia and Ukraine at all. But when the war happens, they, um, they shift the target to Russia and Ukraine. Um, uh, but one thing we learned from that is uh, the really big fish, the really big attackers, uh, the two most active ones, they made only a trivial number of attacks. Um, um, so we talked to a we talked to a few um, website defacers, and we found well, they, they do have a community of website defacers. Uh, so we, we talked to a few of them, and we uh, we found that uh, the big one, the big fish, uh, they 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 were busy making money instead of uh, shifting their focus to uh, attacking Russia and Ukraine, uh, which was a, a war that uh, that was not theirs. So uh, we look at the motivations of website defacers, and we find um, the motivations appear to be very diverse, uh, but uh, more than 70% did, uh, um, did not mention the war at all, and they are mostly for fun, for uh, amusement, or self-expressions, or they're just advertising tools and uh, services to make money. And uh, interestingly, we found some message that support Ukraine um, with 22 de um, the Russian website to help secure the system. Uh, they left a message on the defense page like, I have secured this domain, I love Russia. Uh, they hack into the Russian website to show that message. And uh, similarly, we see uh, 12 defaced uh, Ukrainian website to support Ukraine. They left a message like, hello, Vladimir Zinesky, I'm sorry to hack into the website. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, people need a president like you. We love Ukrainian. Uh, we, we support Ukraine. Um, so uh, regarding uh, underground discussions on hacking forums, we see a fleeting uh, discussion uh, with almost no related discussion prior to the invasions. But on the invasion day, um, there was a rapid surge of war-related posts. Um, uh, but um, this uh, increase also uh, tail off very quickly after a few weeks. 
Um, here is the number of um, uh, here is number of announcement. The first graph um, uh, made on the IT Army of Ukraine channels. Uh, we see a um, the the channels was remarkably active during the first week, but uh, the the activities gradu gradually declined. Um, the second and the third graph are the number of domains and IP addresses promoted by the admins. Uh, you see it's increasing over time, but uh, fewer volunteers were uh, getting involved in attacking um, the promoted target. So, um, in conclusion, it appears that from our data co data um, collections, we see um, uh, the low-level cybercrime actors, they appear to rapidly um, target both countries after the, the invasions using DDoS attack and website defacement, uh, but their interest uh, was quite short-lived. They they get bored over time, and uh, just after a few weeks, they shift their focus to something else, to some other topics. Uh, maybe they um, they they yep they want to make more money, like uh, more money than attacking something that uh, um, that is not theirs. Um, and these actors may have caused immediately a noticeable effect because website defacement and DDoS attack, um, it may, uh, the effect may be um, immediately unnoticeable because you see the website is down or the website has been painted by some, um, some text or some image something like that. Um, but the main impact was uh, probably a, to disseminate propaganda instead of uh, contributing to the hard uh, front light. And uh, we argue that their role and capacity should not be confounded with state actors. And um, yeah, um, one of the next thing um, that might be interested um, um, is that uh, what does the landscape look like in the Israel-Gaza conflict? Um, so uh, we are looking at that, and um, maybe there will be some um, outcomes uh, that I uh, will present soon. So uh, all of the data set is are available for researchers. So please feel free to contact me or contact the Cambridge Cybercrime Center uh, for data access. Thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Yep.